I, I really appreciate um, the youth and, and David and Amy making space for the use of art and culture. Every movement, art and culture, has played a critical role in helping shape the imagination of what's possible. And I want to thank uh, Mama Nia for open up, opening up the space. I want to start with Ms. Fox. And, you know, we, we, we think about safety and freedom being on these two diametrically opposed kind of poles. I'm curious, with your upbringing and background, how did you even become motivated to do this work? So first, good morning. Um, Mama Nia, thank you for that performance. You talk about triggering something. Uh, it reminded me, when I had my daughters, I had two daughters, and my mother, uh, intense joy that I had girls. Um, and I thought it was because I was such a wonderful daughter, she wanted to want me. <laughs> um, and it was because she didn't want me to have the fear that she had every day um, raising my brother, my older brother. And we had that conversation, and I just thought how heartbreaking it was to think the joy of motherhood is tainted with the fear of what it meant to potentially lose him in a way that wasn't natural. So thank you uh, for sharing that. Listen, I grew up um, in, in public housing in the very dangerous part of the city of Chicago in the 70s and 80s. Um, we uh, saw, you, you talk about finding a safe space. Uh, it, it, it felt safe in with the people, um, environment, not so, so much. Uh, I was a victim of a sexual assault as a young girl. I've watched um, people that I know who had been struck down. And for me, it was that feeling of who speaks for girls like me who had seen and had been hurt in such a way that you couldn't talk about it in places you became uh, very isolated. And wanting to have a job where I could have advocacy for people like me. And when I say like me, in that space that had been very really hurt. Um, and at the same time, I had family members who, um, one who had caused the hurt, um, who, who had hurt me. Um, and we shared the same Thanksgiving table. We shared the same grandmother. Uh, we tried to figure out the nuances of what it's like to have us in the same space and what it did for a broader family. And I've had other family members who have been in and out of the criminal justice system. And what I always was rooted in is I wanted to make sure that people were safe. And at the same time, I wanted to make sure that people weren't harmed by the same people who purport to be purveyors of safety. And I think having lived that experience, having not just been a victim of crime, but living with others who had been involved in activity, didn't blur lines of good versus bad, um, good versus evil. Um, I recognized the greatness that was in there, and I wanted to be involved in a system that was absolutely di divided along the lines of we wear the white hats, which invariably meant uh, that they were demonizing whole groups of people, victims and defendants. And so I wanted to do this work um, to give space to the policy and the leadership of someone who has proximity to these issues, to someone who has seen it firsthand, who knows the humanity that's behind it, the complexities behind it, why victims don't want to talk sometimes and not judge them for it. Um, and, and do it in a way that was rooted in that experience, but also recognizing the power of changing policy uh, to make it more fair and just for people. Um, no, thank you for that. Uh, Bishop, I'm coming to you next. And uh, look, by, by way of complete transparency, I'm a deacon in my church. And I know that you have been a champion in, in the Detroit area and really kind of inserting the moral voice of the church in this movement. 
But we also know in the church, there's the politics of respectability, right? Oh, we don't do that. Oh, that's them over there. What challenges have you faced in getting other faith leaders, even members of your congregation, to be a part and want to interrupt some of the violence and the mayhem that's, that's happening in our communities? Uh, I think that the beginning of that is to borrow um, the young lady's conversation, is that you know, to stand up in your congregation as a pastor and to just ask a very simple question, which is, how many of you out there have been victimized? Um, how many of you out there may have a person uh, in your family, if not you yourselves, uh, been involved in some kind of uh, action that has been degrading to your family or brought victimization to your family from whatever standpoint? Um, and when you begin to see that and recognize that the church really is one great big hospital. It's what it is. It's the place where you go um, to get fixed up in another way. And I always liken it kind of to uh, one of the greatest metaphors this side of time, which is the Marvel comic books, right? Um, <laughs> you know, you have um, the federal government who is Captain America, right? Who recognizes that the righteousness of such cause is great, but at the same time, in order to protect the thing you love, which for the federal government, that is democracy, sometimes you end up spilling into doing something that may not be righteous. Uh, you have um, the police department or law enforcement, they're the incredible Hulk, right? They're the ones that, you know, as long as they're calm, things are good. <laughs> um, after that, you don't want to make them angry because you wouldn't like them when they're angry. Uh, you know, then you have Iron Man, who becomes kind of the service providers, right? They're the ones who come up with great technology and strategies in order to bring healing to the world. But sometimes, in their own narcissistic ways and trying to prevent a thing, they can become kind of selfish and self-employed to the things that they bring to the table. And then you have this character who is, you know, all the way off on the side, you have Dr. Strange. And Dr. Strange is there because he does not fight the things that are, um, he doesn't fight the things that are normal or, or materialistic or personable in a way. He's there to fight those things that are ethereal, those things that are spiritual, that evil that lies beneath and that causes the material systems to go. But sometimes ends up being peaked upon himself. I think that the church is very difficult sometimes to interact with them because just like we do service providers and other people, we often go in with a solution telling them what it is that they need to do. Even though we may have never gone to the church, we may not know the pastor, we may not know the source of their doctrines or what they do, but we have, just like we do police officers, an assumption of what they're supposed to do. So you have people who walk up to a police officer and say, well, you're the police. You're supposed to. Although they've never been a police officer, they've never gone through the training, they've never done any of that. Well, people do the church like that as well. You know, they say, well, you're a church person. You're a pastor. You're supposed to. Even though they've never gone to church, they've never read the doctrine format, they've never done any of that. And I think one of the ways to face the challenge, because that is the challenge, the church is somewhat offended sometimes when people come in and presume and assume what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, but if you could let the church be who they are and let them find their own way into that work as proposed to assuming what it is that they can do or assuming what it is they're supposed to do, then they become, it becomes a part of the natural progress because again, that is what the church is there for. They're a hospital. And once they recognize that and tend to their own victims as opposed to uh, and also add to that, tending to a larger span of victimization. You know, I have, I'm often told by gang members, well, you're not one of us, so how can you speak to us? I'm often told by police officers, well, you're not really one of us. How do you speak to us, right? I think there's a common thread. All of us have been victimized. When you look at the history of the country and everything that's gone on, all of us have been victimized. And there's a common thread. I've been. I've been jumped on twice, once left for dead. I've been stabbed, I've been shot at, I've been stabbed at a funeral actually. 
I've been shot at. I've been carjacked. My wife has suffered uh, sexual abuse. Uh, I mean, and out of all of that, there's either a sense of either you stand up and you become a part of the solution or you let the problem bury you. And I simply bring that to churches. And that's how we've been able to format that with the team in Detroit. No, thank you for that. Lenore, I'm, I'm coming to you often. Um, law enforcement components, uh, whether it's the police or, or, or district attorneys, often say that they're speaking in the voice and in the name of survivors, right? We, we are representing them. Um, your work at Californians for Safety and Justice and now with the Alliance for Safety and Justice has disrupted that dynamic a bit. And you've really done a lot of uh, analysis around what survivors want. Can you share a little bit of that? Sure, uh, and good morning. It's a real honor to be on the stage with uh, all these uh, if people. I'm a big fan of pretty much everyone around me, so thank you for having me. Uh, so, you know, I'm a former assistant district attorney. Uh, before that, I uh, was an advocate for uh, youth who were incarcerated. Uh, and so when we launched Californians for Safety and Justice uh, and now the Alliance for Safety and Justice five years ago, uh, I knew that, uh, you know, our goal, reform criminal justice, replace over-incarceration with investments that are balanced, a balanced approach to public safety, prevention, rehabilitation, community health. And so in setting out to achieve that goal, uh, we had to ask a question, why hasn't it happened yet? What is the, the holdup? Uh, most criminologists will tell you that uh, too much incarceration is dangerous and unsafe. Uh, most people who work inside the criminal justice system see that cycle over and over again and experience it as frustrating and dysfunctional. Uh, but in the level of the popular discourse, the, the mainstream conversation, uh, the debate has really been one of you're either pro-public safety, which tends to mean you're tough on crime and you support uh, increased incarceration, or you're pro-civil liberties, right? Well, when we put uh, you know, safety up against civil liberties uh, at a values level, um, one of those is always going to win out, and reasonably so. Um, the question to ask is, is that really the debate? Is that really the conversation we should be having when it comes to public safety policy? Um, so we set out to investigate that. If, if the issue here is that this is being uh, upheld as the, the only choice you can make if you really believe in safety, why don't we go directly to those who have experienced a lack of safety? Why don't we go directly to survivors of crime and ask them, uh, what would you like to see? What have been your experiences with the current criminal justice system and what would you like to see in your uh, public safety policy priorities? And, and what we found uh, really flips on its head this notion that you're uh, somehow not on the side of public safety uh, if you want a reformed uh, criminal justice system. We did focus groups with crime survivors. Uh, we did public opinion research, uh, phone call research. Uh, we worked with and reached out to grassroots organizations in neighborhoods that have high rates of crime and violence, um, who have a lot of members who are crime survivors, uh, to ask them their experiences. So we gathered all this uh, information, and what we found was that, uh, in fact, most crime survivors experience the uh, current approaches to criminal justice as uh, ineffective at best. Uh, most also actually experience them as unsafe. Uh, so uh, what, what crime survivors think is that uh, prison in general, it, it either does nothing uh, or it makes matters worse. Uh, and that it also depletes resources from the very things that uh, communities need uh, to heal and to uh, prevent uh, crime from happening in the first place. So when you, uh, you know, talk about what would you like to see from your investments, um, you know, these are the things that we found, and this is all, you know, through uh, a diverse uh, public opinion research uh, that's representative of uh, uh, crime survivors as well as representative of, uh, 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 you know, young, old, uh, Republican, uh, you know, Democrat, uh, liberal, conservative, uh, urban, rural, uh, racially demographics, uh, racial demographics diversity. We found across the board, across all those constituencies, what crime survivors will tell you is we want to see investments into rehabilitation and treatment at the community level 
Uh, we want to see community supervision uh, programs that uh, uh, address the drivers of crime. We want to see uh, re-entry practices that support people uh, coming home to communities, and that all of those things should take precedence over investments into prisons and jails. That's what crime victims want. So when we, when we look at it that way, uh, then we would have a, a really different set of uh, public safety investments and, and, and uh, public safety policies. So we decided to go ahead and try and use those voices to organize crime survivors to advance uh, criminal justice reform. And um, we've had remarkable uh, responses. We, we started taking crime survivors uh, up to the state capitol in, in Sacramento. And uh, this is a place where uh, the tough on crime lobby has significant influence. And it was amazing. We walked into rooms with legislators and we would say, you know, okay, you know, everyone go around and say who you are and, and what you're here to talk about. Uh, and we would have uh, legislators, you know, kind of writing, you know, doing what legislators do, very busy people. And, you know, it's like, I'm a crime survivor. Um, you know, I, I lost my son to violence or I was a victim of sexual assault. And I'm here to tell you, don't build that prison in my name. <laughs> And it was like you could hear a pen drop, right? <laughs> I mean, you literally, legislators would look up from their desks, and we had one that said, where have you been for the last 30 years? Please tell me why we haven't heard from uh, 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 organized uh, communities uh, at this level and at this scale. So that's what we're trying to do. We're, uh, we're organizing crime survivors all across the country now. Um, we're in six different states, and it's been uh, really exciting to see the impact that this is uh, having on, on the conversation uh, because we're, we're kind of busting through that myth that you are either civil liberties or safety and, and, and change it and say, listen, this is actually about which pathway to safety is the one that those who've been most victimized by uh, crime and violence want to see. No, thank you for that. Uh, Fatima. Mama Nia talked about, in her piece, uh, trauma, living in the body. And you know, we, the science actually documents that, that your brain chemistry changes after a particularly uh, traumatic event. What does trauma-informed care, what does trauma-informed justice look like to you? Hi everyone, um, I feel so honored to be on the stage with such incredible people and I want to acknowledge everyone out there for all the work that you're doing. Um, as, a, as a survivor of um, a sexual abuse in childhood and attempted kidnapping um, and, and really the survivor of being in neighborhoods concentrated poverty, which as we all know creates the conditions for interpersonal violence and trauma to emerge. Um, what I want trauma-informed care to, be, to have is an analysis of race and history. I believe that it is a fundamental uh, opportunity in trauma-informed care that you won't often hear uh, when you talk to folks who are trauma therapists because we are, we are not only concerned about you know, the healing of people in the moment, but I want us to have a broader social context that trauma is intergenerational, that we have, there's a number of uh, research studies that are looking at epigenetics and uh, the transference of uh, traumatic stress from uh, mother to child. Um, there's, and then there's history. Um, we have not dealt seriously with the vestiges of slavery and, um, and that those uh, harms um, at a social and a political level influence and shape the conditions that people, um, that people um, live in. And that is stored in the body as well. And so when we get, when we use trauma as a frame of analysis in the way that I've described, there are a number of things that can emerge. Um, and we, so individual and interpersonal healing is possible, um, that people um, have the capacity not to pathologize themselves and say, here, here are things that have happened to me, while, while it's important to acknowledge those things that happened, because those are real things, but that it gives us tools and an understanding of what we can do to heal and be empowered in a political context. So I'm using trauma again differently to say that, that by understanding trauma, we then emerge. Let me give you an example of that in our work at Equal Justice USA we use this analysis of trauma to bring community members um, folks who are in education child welfare and law enforcement together and we use this frame we talk about trauma and we allow people to not only identify their own trauma but be witnessed by the other right so often officers 
don't get to talk about their own trauma and this history and the impact it has on their job, that their badge itself is traumatizing in communities and the impact that has on them and their families, and to have community witness that. Likewise, for community to, to share their experiences, not only of individual trauma, but chronic intergenerational trauma, the history of trauma in their communities, and have others listen to these social service providers and law enforcement listen to their stories, how incredibly powerful that is. We, we organize family members of murder victims who want to be witness in the stories of their sons being taken away and their daughters being taken away. And they want systems change and policy change to arise out of being witnessed and being seen. So that's the opportunity of trauma-informed care is to be witnessed in a particular way. What emerges is remarkable. So by bringing folks together and using this frame and allowing these groups to see one another and understand with empathy the conditions that we're all in what emerges are ideas and, and um, policy change that folks are activated to do. So that, again, there's a politicizing, there's a moving forward, there's, a, there's an opportunity to then make change, and folks are excited, system providers and um, system actors, rather, and community to work together. So that's the opportunity of trauma-informed care. And I, I wanna push for those of us who are, work with social workers um, and, and trauma therapists to, to see that there is a context much larger than individual services. So I don't want trauma-informed care to just be therapy. Though therapy is important, treatment is important. There is a much broader context and opportunity and I, and I want to push us all to merge with that framework for trauma-informed work. Deputy Chief Phil, I, I've saved you for last in this first lightning round, if you will, uh, purposely. And, you know, just reading a little bit about your career, um, you know, you have been in the thick of this for a while, right? In 80s and 90s at the height of the crack cocaine epidemic and uh, really the proliferation of gang violence. How has your view um, of particularly people who might have been on the wrong side of the law at one time and now on the right side doing some of the violence interruption work, how has your view of those folks evolved over the years? So I, I started uh, in, well, I'm, I'm third generation South LA born and I started working in Watts in 1980 as a new officer out of the academy. And a lot of the folks that I work with now, we, we kid around. I used to chase you. <laughs> and uh, we, we've built quite a relationship. But go move forward to 2007. I went to, back to Watts as a captain of the station. And I, when I got there, I was the sixth captain in five years. And the community was crying out for some stability. The community was crying out for officers who could police with respect, for officers who could, um, could, could, could do the job uh, in, a, in a way that didn't defend the community. And the captain that was leaving, he said, here you go, it's your station now, you're one 25-year-old police officer away from a riot. And over the three or four years prior to that, during- That, that had to be encouraging, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, in, in a week after I got there, and about the same time he told me that, there had been an officer-involved shooting, and a, a big group of very angry people came and, and tried to take over the station. And, and along with your 125-year-old police officer away from a riot, he said, you need to figure out a way to get into this community and to communicate and to fix this. And so I started going that next Monday to a, a meeting at, in Watts called the Watts Gang Task Force. And it was a meeting that was pulled together by a, a council person who uh, had no clue what else to do, but the community came and said, we've had, it's, it's Christmas, and we've just had 10 people killed, and you need to do something. So she pulled this meeting together, and when the community came in, they were very angry because she also brought the police with. And we don't want the police here, we want this fixed. And, and that statement in itself is very telling. So I started coming to those meetings and, and, and literally two hours every Monday, every week, 
uh, for the next two to three years, I, I heard much of the same kind of, of discussions, talk as I've heard in here yesterday. It was very anti-police. It was a lot of anger. It was a lot of frustration. And so I realized, and, and this kind of came up yesterday, I realized that they're, they're, this community is not angry at me, they're angry at this uniform. They're angry at what this uniform has done. And I had been around long enough to understand what that uniform had done. And in order to, to, to deal with this, I, I really had to understand, and keep in mind, everybody in here has their own paradigm. How they see things based on where they are from, you know, I hear a lot of talk in here about the federal government. We don't even know what that is in California. It's too far away. And quite frankly, I'm okay with that. <laughs> and a lot of the issues that, that, that occur in California uh, are, are, are people who, who migrated or came to California in the 40s from the South to get away from the very harsh racism. And when they got there, uh, they came there to get jobs, they, they, they moved into South LA and primarily Watts because there was a lot of factories and a lot of work and at the end of World War II that all went away. And so having lived through the 65 riots, having lived through the, the 92 riots at this time, I realized how important it was that I had to hear. And so I did and I heard and as I heard I, I tried to do what was in in my power as a station commander to make changes. And I got rid of some officers. You know, when, when people keep saying the same name and telling you this person's a problem, and then you go to that cop and he says, eh, nobody understands but me, that's a problem. <laughs> and it's time for that person to go work somewhere else. And so I got rid of a number of officers and I heard and I heard and I apologized for things because apology is necessary. You can't start making amends until you apologize, you're serious about it. And part of that seriousness means making those changes. So as that happened, the pounding started getting a little less and then the pounding started to move to me. Because in order to make change, first you have to have function can't have change when you have dysfunction. And this was a dysfunctional relationship. The community had dysfunction, the police department had dysfunction, and we had to both fix it. And once you get to a point where one person's working at it, now it's time for the other side to start working together. And the community had to understand that if they really wanted to see these killings stopped, and we had a couple of, of surges, 2008 we had a 72-hour period where 17 people were shot and 15 dead over the same kid that, caught, that, that was shot in that, that first one that started the Watts Gang Task Force. So it was now time to start working together and for the community to start taking responsibility for things in the community. And I, I'm going to go long story short here. Several years later, about 2010, 2011, the community started saying, we are not going to tolerate kids in our community carrying guns. We are going to work together with the police. We started a program in 2011 called the Community Safety Partnership. We had built the foundation to where we had enough trust and working relationship, and now we could bring officers in, and, and in Watts, there's, there's four major housing developments. In three of them, we brought in 10 officers and a supervisor. And the direction was, you're going to go in here and you're going to build relationships. You're not going in to make arrests. That was pretty hard for some cops. And it took some pulling back and going, no, that's not your job. What we saw was 21 programs started, cops coaching football, Girl Scout troops, Boy Scout troops. We saw partnership with community-based organizations. We saw um, educational uh, programs that started that, that went from having a couple of kids involved in some scholarships to today, 63 kids from Watts in private schools. The first one, 
just, uh, just got accepted into uh, Boston College, all paid for. We saw officers getting invited to go to funerals. We saw officers being invited to be part of a repass. And we saw violent crime drop about 45% in Watts. What, what was astonishing to me was we, we saw in, in three, the three public housing developments, they averaged seven homicides a year. And we went almost two years without one. Wow. What was amazing to me was when we had the homicide, the first homicide, I saw the community reacting differently than I had seen for years prior. I, I saw a community reacting with fear instead of anger. I saw a community that had reached the safe spot because they weren't living around constant homicides, gunfire. And I saw fear that, my God, are we gonna go back to that? But what, what, was, what was different at that point was we had now a community working together with us. And now six years later, uh, we went from seven a year to a little less than three per year average over that six year time period. But almost every single one of those was solved within two weeks. And it was because people trusted the officers and came to the officers. And you know, I, I, you, you talk about putting people on the stand, that doesn't work. And so when people would call, they would give information. Now the officers knew where to look. Putting a case together is not, not impossible without the witness. Today, with, with cameras, with DNA, with everything else, you can do it. And so we, we, we literally transformed a community. And now to answer your question, um, some of those folks that I used to chase are some of my best friends now. And, but it's because their heart is pure. And they truly are community leaders who want to make change, who have the courage to stand up and say we're changing. And depending on where you are in South LA, depending on, on the, 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 the length of the evolution, if you go into Watts, the intervention folks there will come up and hug a cop at a crime scene. If you go into other places, they don't want you coming up and talk to them yet. We haven't got there, but it's all an evolution. But I have been really, really clear that anybody that wants to work together to make a difference and anything that we can do to bring in restorative justice, to bring in things that don't involve incarceration, I'm there for it. But in moving towards that direction, we have to keep in mind that I've been to over 500 homicides in the last 10 years. And we can't just say, that we're gonna stop making stops, we're gonna stop doing things. We have to work together with the community. When we have a shooting, when we have a homicide now, I go to community leaders, they go in the neighborhood and say, y'all better get off the streets because they're coming. Because we had somebody that messed up. And we need to work together to get that person taken care of. If they can take care of it on their own and get, get that person help or get them out of there, that's fine. But if that, there's a lot of people who aren't ready for that yet and just, want to continue being violent. And that's when I think you gotta put somebody in jail. No, thank you for that, uh, Chief. Um, Lenore, I'm coming to you in, in a second, uh, but I wanna first highlight you know, the reality that folks have multiple identities, right? Existing in one body. I'm both a formerly incarcerated person, but I'm also a survivor of crime. Robbed at gunpoint, home invaded, kidnapped, moved from room to room because they were looking for that dope pack. And it wasn't until maybe about 2014, I'm at Danielle Sarid's shop at Common Justice, that I even had the epiphany that I could be considered a crime survivor. I never thought of myself that way. I thought I didn't deserve that designation. Uh, I thought I signed up for that, that I didn't deserve to be safe. And so I'm, I'm, I'm coming to you, Lenore, in 
some of the work that you all have done, you all have really centered, right? The people who are most disproportionately impacted and likely to be survivors and victimized, and we're talking about African Americans and Latino males ages 15 to 35, right, when you're talking about serious harm. And, and I think that has also been a disruption, right? That you've changed the face, the preconceived idea of victimization and who survivors can be. Can you, can you talk a little bit about how you all uh, came to that work and how that's been operationalized? Uh, well, you know, uh, bef before we started uh, our work, uh, I used to work with parents of incarcerated youth, and we would uh, organize uh, parents to try and change uh, juvenile justice policies to uh, advance alternatives to incarceration over uh, youth, youth prisons. And, uh, you know, we, part of what I learned in, in doing that work for many years was that every one of the young people that I met uh, you know, facing years behind bars in juvenile halls on, you know, juvenile probation, every one of them had been a victim of crime much earlier in life. Everyone. And I can say I've never met a juvenile who is in the criminal justice system or the juvenile justice system who has not had some prior experience of a serious lack of protection, significant victimization, and little to no uh, response from any of the public systems that touch uh, the lives of these young people. And, and so I think one of the uh, drivers behind uh, the work that we do is telling the truth about that and telling the truth about uh, what it means when we don't see people and we don't see who they are and what their experiences are. Um, and if we could see the truth, if we were honest about who really is likely to face a lack of protection, what would that mean in terms of how we invested our, our public safety dollars? Um, and so, you know, I think that uh, we, 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 uh, we hold that to be true and, and understand that just from experience, um, but we wanted to show it too. We wanted, you know, we, I know we know our friends in criminal justice policy like data, and um, so we, we actually went and, you know, let's survey, you know. And, uh, it, you know, it, our first survey we did in California, we, we did one in Illinois, and we also have now done one nationally. Uh, and uh, young African American and Latino males uh, are the most likely to be uh, repeat victims of crime. Not, not just one, one time uh, experience, but repeat victims of crime through, through life. Uh, and so if, if that is true, right, uh, then it sure seems like we know enough, right, to, 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 to place some heavy uh, time and attention on what it looks like to invest in protecting the safety of those who are most vulnerable. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that's what the data is. Um, and then when I, t I talked earlier about, and most crime survivors want uh, a balanced approach to safety and new investments, that holds true, by the way, across demographic groups, right? It's not just those most likely to be repeat victims of crime who want a new approach. Um, you know, we have a diverse membership. Uh, we have uh, rural uh, 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 white members, uh, uh, you know, urban African American Latino members. And across all of our membership, folks want a different investment. So we set out to achieve that. We uh, uh, advocated in, in California uh, for uh, reducing incarceration, taking that money and putting it into uh, trauma recovery centers in the, uh, for crime survivors in the communities least served, um, as well as prevention and rehabilitation. We passed Proposition 47 in 2014. Uh, in its first year, it reduced incarceration by 15,000 in the prison and jail, saved $102 million that just got invested uh, just last uh, week. They announced the investments. Uh, 15 different counties are receiving local dollars uh, for prevention rehabilitation programming. We also have a trauma recovery services. Uh, we went from having one trauma recovery center in California to now having nine. Um, and we've also brought the trauma recovery center model to other states and there's now 17 across the country. Um, and all of that started with asking the question, who is not protected? Who is lacking protection? And what does it look like to invest in them? No, thank you for that. Uh, DA Fox, <clears throat> you are in Chicago. And can you talk a little bit about how you as an elected official navigate kind of an interesting space, right? BYP 100, BLM, Charlene Carruthers, I know those folks, right? You're, you're 
representing them and their safety and wellness interests, right? While at the same time, you work hand in hand with CPD all day, every day in you know, making cases and doing the work of a prosecutorial office. Can you shed a little bit uh, of light of how it is to kind of walk that tightrope and, and, and navigate that space? Yeah, so I've been in office a little over six months, and so I'm still trying to figure out how to do the, the balance. But I don't, I don't even know if it's so much a balance, right? I am uh, the first African-American woman to hold this office. I'm the first African-American elected to this office. We had someone appointed um, back in 1989 for about eight months um, in a city uh, that is a largely minority city in a criminal justice system that is 86% African-American and Latino in Cook County, a juvenile justice system that is 92% African-American and Latino, um, largely male. Um, and I was not, I mean, I ran on a platform of this is out of whack, this is disjointed, I talked about race. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm black, right? Like, it's, I can't walk in a room and pretend. Um, and for some people, who would want you to, like I cannot do that. And the disparities in the justice system and the angst and, and frustration that those groups and communities at large had to go into this position and not wear that, I think would be disingenuous. Um, and so for some on, on the, from, not even just from the police side, but even in my own office, when you talk about race and the dynamics of race, or when you say that the community doesn't trust us, right? I mean, people who go into these jobs, and I know the deputy chief can, can adhere to this, there's that belief, right, that you're, you're the good guy. Mm -hmm. And when you say, you know what, people don't trust you, and they don't trust you because the system has been disproportionately <coughs> um, adverse to black, so it's systemic racism, when you say racism in those spaces as a black person, there's an immediate kind of defensiveness that comes to it. And there's an immediate kind of, you know, protective barrier that comes up of what is she now going to try to do? Um, and so that's what I have to contend with in those spaces where, you know, to the point that was made, we have to tell the truth and keep telling the truth because the success in this work is contingent upon the relationship with the community. And I can't afford to not have honest conversations even with my partners um, who are unfamiliar with someone like me in this space. And at the same time, for the community, um, where I have to keep saying I'm six months in, having inherited a system um, that has been centuries in the making of dysfunction, um, that you're not gonna be able to absolve or solve all the issues of race and the, and the dynamic of the community in six months. So there's a constant, it's not so much a, a balancing act, but level setting kind of across the board of we have a lot to do and that angst uh, that the community feels, again, not even for those that are organizing, we have a lot of really robust organization that's happening in Chicago um, that has really come to the forefront in the wake of the Laquan McDonald case. But we also have you know, church and communities who, elders who tell the stories of their distrust of the system. It, it's not just this new wave of young I mean, it permeates. Like, I'm in my own family, you mm -hmm. talk about, you know, what it's like now, you know, at the barbecues and my cousins <laughs> like stuff. Um, <laughs> um, and, I, and I saw that, right? And to the point that's been made about, you know, victimization and, and kind of the multi roles that people have, you know, I've never known one set of people. Mm -hmm. I've never in my whole life, even when contending with my own feelings, and the same people who have been hurt and harmed, having distrust and fear of the system to help them, um, is really a disruption of, of, of everything that we hold dear in terms of safe spaces. That if the people who are harmed the most trust you the absolute least, what are we doing? And if we don't have that honest conversation in the positions that we hold, if, we, if it becomes an anti-law enforcement or civil rights issue, we will never get there. And so I try it everywhere that I go uh, to talk about that. I talk about you know, the, the, 
how we view victims um, in my own office. Because, you know, if we are defenders of victims, and today my victim is, you know, sitting at the table by, on my side, but next week he's sitting across, mm -hmm. does our level of empathy or understanding change? Mm -hmm. Does our level of engagement change? <coughs> when we see his mother, when he's sitting next to me, sitting in the hall, and we're telling her what's happening on the case, but then we see her next week because he's on the side of the table and we don't say anything to her. Why do people trust us? Mm -hmm. And if we don't meaningfully have those <coughs> conversations, and they're difficult, and they are, they are difficult conversations, particularly amongst our partners. Because again, these are folks who come into this work wanting to do good. But if you don't acknowledge, and not just acknowledge, but like work every day to figure out, and, and it's not just, people get irritated when I say, it's not just an implicit bias training class. <laughs> um, that you do it and you're like, well, I did it, and I know I have a bias. No. <laughs> what, what, what is that voice? Is that like? <laughs> when you say we have to do more, the response is why I did this class. Yeah. And what it, what it that irritates me. And so what we do, <laughs> Awesome, awesome. You talked about you talked about triggering earlier, and in your comment, it, it reminded me of um, in the Triangle area. We had a very unfortunate murder of a UNC student body president a few years ago, and one of the one of the two perpetrators of that murder, the mother of that person was going to one courtroom looking for the mercy for her son because he was on trial for cap murder. Was, the state was trying to kill him. But she also had another son who had been murdered and she's going to another courtroom 30 miles down the road looking for justice. So you talk about that kind of, that duality, right? And how, what does the empathy gap look like when someone is sitting in one chair as opposed to another? And that's really, really real. Uh, Chief, we've been talking, uh, Deputy Chief, we've been talking, I'm elevating you, I'm giving you a promotion. We've been talking I don't know about if I want that. <laughs> we've been talking about a lot about trust and trust building. That isn't manna from heaven that just falls from the sky, right? We got to do something to create that. Can you? For other law enforcement in the room, can you operationalize that? What does that look like? What kind of very concretized, specific things did you all do that could be replicated in other jurisdictions to build that trust? I, I have a really, really good operational example. And you know, you, you, you talked about going out and talking to people. And, and that's one of the worst things uh, when it comes to cops, getting them just to talk to people. And so we had a homicide scene, and a 17-year-old and was killed. Two others were shot. And at the time, we had yellow, the yellow tape up. And you know, cops aren't allowed on the other side of the yellow tape. That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> it is like there's a barrier there. I, I know it's to keep people out, but I think a lot of cops think that there's some kind of a, a, a ray or something that they can't go on the other side because it's community on that side. So we have this crime scene. It's right outside schools. There is, uh, it's 
two o'clock in the afternoon, right after a, a high school and a junior high had just gotten out. And there was a lot of very, very um, angry, upset, emotional folks that were there. And because it was outside of schools, there had been a, uh, a pretty significant media response out there. Now, this is in an area where I talked about a community safety partnership program. We're getting ready to start another one outside of public housing development. And we've been in the outreach phase where we're going to the community, and how do you want, what do you want, what are you looking for? And a, a, a guy who grew up in that community, one of the folks that you're talking about earlier who had been on that other side, who did not have any patience or any relationship with any police officers at all, I had met him a couple of times and we had had some conversation and a little bit of that wall had gone down. He was there because he was very significant in that, that, that neighborhood, that gang that was involved in, in this homicide. And I had already given a couple of, of interviews talking about what had happened and uh, now I had been told that the 17 year old had died. And so I was walking over to a whole bunch of cameras that were out there to give a follow-up interview and, and let them know that he had died. And when I got over to the cameras, I saw him standing out talking with a, a couple of other guys, and so I, I stopped and I told the media, hold on a second. And I went over underneath the tape, went out over to him, put my arm around him and said, I want you to know before I get on the camera that the 17-year-old kid has died. And I'm gonna give you a second before I go on camera for you to get with the community and let them know. And I turned around, walked away, waited about 10 minutes, and then I got over to the, to the media and I gave the interview. I think that's probably one of the best examples uh, of what you can do to humanize the community of the cops and the cops to the community. Now that guy has gone to four different meetings I've been to since. And, and, and stop the conversation to tell people what I did and the respect that that showed to him and to that community. And, you know, from my perspective, this really isn't hard stuff. It's just being a person who cares, being a person who has some empathy and being a person who understands that, that every homicide kills people in two families. And, and after that, about three days, four days later, I stayed in contact with him and my wife and I went out and we visited the, the mother of that kid who I had met out there while she was watching her son die. And so to bring the human side to police work, I think is really, really important because it kind of keeps us both grounded. No, thank you for that. Uh, Fatima, did you have something to add? Yes, yeah, so there are several things I wanted to, to speak to. And I'm, I'm so grateful, again, for the dialogue here because I think this analysis and what you shared about the humanity of people um, helping people and the empathy that any officer can take on at any time. Um, but I also want to be sure that we're clear that to go from no relationship to something is powerful. But what we're ultimately up to is redistribution of power such that, such that it's located in the community. That community-driven solutions are really where trust lies, I think. When, when we are now moving budgets in such a way that community members are able to be empowered to interrupt violence before it starts, so that we're not looking at a homicide and then what we do to, to build trust inside of that, right? We don't want um, harm happening. And there are public health uh, solutions that can support that, right? There are a number of um, interventions that, that provide, that empower communities and provide solutions to these problems. And we want to ensure that there is space for, for those discussions. And they're much harder right? Because there are big budgets in police departments. And um, I do believe that there is a space for when we talk about 
empowering and talking to community, that those leaders also require the support. So I, I wanna talk about capacity building for those leaders, right? Um, we um, talk about, and Lenore talks about this as well, around Victims of Crime Act uh, dollars that you know the federal government um, has over, over $2.5 billion for, for victims of crime, not just individual compensation, but for service providers that disproportionately go um, not to the most marginalized, disenfranchised communities. Um, and so there are, there are billions of dollars out there that are actually available. States have been given so much money, some of them have to give it back because they don't know what to do with it. We've called them. And they're not going to community-led efforts that can actually make a difference. If we know that hurt people hurt people, right, when we have this analysis and we know the number of victimized folks who are then perpetrating crime, and we know we can do something and we have dollars to do it and no one's drawing that line, the system is broken. No, thank you for that. Before we open it up to audience q and A, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to the bishop. For, so he can have the last word, at least with my Q&A. And I'm reminded uh, by a lesson that I learned from Valerie Jarrett. And Valerie had a line that I've taken with me that culture shift eats strategy for breakfast. We change the culture. Law, policy, practice follows, right? And we can see numerous examples in contemporary society. I'll just lift up the LGBTQ community and marriage equality as one illustrative example of how the culture of how we thought about folks shifted. Then the legal regime, the practice regime followed, right? Bishop, what role does the faith community play and how can they help shift the culture of all of these issues that we're talking about, crime, violence, these multiple identities. When you look at it, especially in African-American community, the church really, it, they're not called to do anything any different than what they've always done. They've always led that, that movement. They've always been at the front of whatever cultural norms needed to change or whatnot, that's what they were. I think that one of the challenges is that oftentimes, you know, back, uh, I believe in the Bush administrations, this uh, terminology was coined faith-based, right? Uh, and it was supposed to be coined to give uh, those of us who are practicing faith and practitioners of faith a doorway into helping and assisting from a governmental or federal uh, level to be able to assist in some of these issues. But then they turned around and they wrote all the policies so that we can't use our faith, which is the thing that we use to heal and to change these cultural norms. We can't use our faith base in order to be a part of that healing. Um, and I think that a return to that kind of thinking will, will once again place us um, at the interim, at the doorway of what that looks like. Um, and I. I want to just utilize some of what Ms. Fatima said. You know, it takes the teamwork concept, and because of that kind of spiraling downward of the ideology behind faith based versus nonprofit versus this, that, or the other, we've again separated communities even the more. And I think that that kind of has to come back together. Uh, and I'm not talking about, let me just, I really need to say this. I'm not talking about religion, okay? I'm not talking about whether or not uh, someone is Baptist, this or that or the other. I mean, my faith tradition is that of Christianity. And in the book of James, chapter one, it actually talks about what true religion is. True religion is the work, the manifestation of spiritual belief. Means it is to take care of the motherless and the widows and the fatherless and to provide strategies that heal people and help people and, and cause no harm. Um, and I think that, you know, sometimes we, we look at it in the sense of religion and I'm talking about spirituality. I'm talking about things, the word that everyone keeps saying up here, empathy. For me, that is the largest word in the dictionary. It's the one that brings everything that we're talking about to a, to a head. And it is so important, um, 
Um, I understand that the arts also can lead the way. Um, I did a, 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 a musical project which I utilized you to- brought C You brought CDs? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Yes, shameless plug. Um, I learned that from Chief Jackson. I mean, Captain Jackson, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, over the way. Um, no, but I actually uh, utilized this to make donations. We built a coalition in the city of Detroit. We have about 100 churches, but about 32 that are active or so, are really evolved around this work. Uh, we didn't receive government funding. I was just learned about VOCA uh, about a year ago, uh, and we've been actively trying to get involved in that. But last year alone, we spent very close to some $20,000, and that's, out, that's just cash. That's outside of you know uh, gifts and kinds and things like that, to feed people, to, um, to help, those who are gang members who could have been victimized, but because they were a gang member, no one can see them as a victim, right? <laughs> right? Uh, we've stepped in, helped pay for funerals. We've, we've done all this kind of work. And so I use this project um, to kind of help raise funds for, for that work as well. But the reason I brought it up really is because on here is a song, it's called Empathy. It's not a gospel uh, CD, it's a relational CD because I want to see the world, that's what I feel like is missing from the world, is empathy. And when you can get faith leaders to sit down with police, I'm about to give you a promotion as well. All right. Yeah. When we can sit down together with others who have been victimized, others who are survivors, other, when we can all sit down together and just simply understand what it feels like to be you, then we'll recognize it's not so different. You're not so different. One of the things that we do as a concrete in the city of Detroit, in the fifth precinct area, uh, we've started community police uh, relations. We've had, we had a woman who came who 20 years ago, her brother was killed, shot and killed by a police officer. For 20 years, she had suffered with pain, hated the police. We convinced her to come to this summit. All she wanted to be healed was to know what happened. And back at that time, police policy was you did not share that kind of information, investigative information, with those who were of residential basis or non-police. So we took that information. I mean, she cried the table, we cried the table. We took that information back to the chief. The chief said, well, we're in a new day. So we had another summit just two weeks ago where uh, the chief, gave that information to the commander and said, you can share this information with her. The look on her face of healing was so, it was so amazing. She just wanted to know what happened. And giving her that information, being empathic, because the chief's words were, I would want to know if someone were killed that I loved. I would want to know. And so those are kinds of the concrete things that I believe faith-based in changing those norms of the community, helping change those norms of police departments, federal government, prosecutors, everyone. We've all got to work together. And I think that the faith uh, is at the center, is at the core of that. So I'm going to flex my empathy muscles and uh, give over the question uh, opportunity to the audience because I could do this all day with these amazing folks. I think we have some folks in the audience that have some mics that are gonna help with the Q&A period, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, I have a two-fold, because I was the last one yesterday and I didn't get an opportunity to speak, okay? You've been holding on to that, huh? I've been holding on, <laughs> okay? Here it is, okay, and I'm gonna address something um, Bishop said. I'm from New York City, okay? I went to Fort Hamilton High School. I got beat up in a race riot in 77. The police didn't stop it. They told me I know I shouldn't be in this, I, I should know I shouldn't be in this neighborhood. And my friend got killed there, okay? Then I joined what we call the New York posses, okay? We don't call them gangs here. Then I got kicked out of New York because I was too bad and moved to Florida. When I moved to Jacksonville, Florida, I started helping people like me. I gained great success that President George W. Bush hired me to run the faith-based initiative. 
okay? I'm Garland Scott, that's my name. What Bishop was saying about the community partnership, faith-based initiative article HR7 failed because of one reason. The faith base would not work together. It was not a collaborative effort. When we reviewed the grants, they had no budget justification. They couldn't explain what they were gonna do with that money. So we had to change it to faith and community base. And the 800 pound gorillas had to take over again and change the policies. So I resigned from working for the White House because of the criterias, but because of my knowledge, my tenure, and my empathy in my city in Jacksonville, Florida, here's the question now. They pulled me on to start working with the first black sheriff, Nat Glover. Great job, he had to leave. All the work failed. Next year, I worked with another sheriff, John Rutherford. He had to leave. Two sheriffs. Now we had the third sheriff, uh, Mike Williams. Brilliant guy, he's got some great work, okay? We sustained the violence, we sustained the partiality, we sustained the prejudice. How do we sustain fixing this? We're talking about, I've been in hundreds of these things, and we're talking, they're great ideas. I have a friend of mine, he mentored me. His name was Dr. Miles Monroe. And he said to me, Americans have a problem why they never win the Olympics track and field. He said they're very fast, but they don't know how to pass the baton. How do we do that? Anybody on the panel? Well, I want to begin um, because I wholeheartedly agree. Um, and I would be just like uh, any law enforcement agency or anyone else. Um, I would be remiss to say that faith-based organizations, churches, imams, whatever you want to call them, um, have an issue with working together. Um, I'm very familiar with that being a struggle. And I think that I didn't really answer your first question, which might lend some bearings there. Because you asked, how do I face that challenge of getting churches basically to work together? I don't. We don't have time to try to convince people <laughs> about what they need to be doing. What I have been very strategic about doing, and, and our Detroit team can tell you, is I, I take the people who are doing the work already and may not even be aware that they're doing the work. They aren't necessarily looking for cameras or anything like that. When I first became involved in Ceasefire Detroit, I didn't even know there was a budget. I was a, I was a victim before. I was a survivor, I wanted to help other people get to that place of surviving and to be able to help other folk. Ceasefire was in my area. I said, hey, I wanna be a part of that. Had no idea that grants and all that stuff were, were in, was, was involved. So I guess I'm saying um, that what I plan to take on here, and I think that's the thing sometimes, kind of like the Wiley Coyote effect, right? Wiley, you, you like I love, I love, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Doesn't every Detroiter, <laughs> I mean, right? Um, uh, you know, but Wiley Coyote, right? So, so he, so he goes to the, he goes to the Acme shop. He buys this contraption. He puts it together. The contraption he uses it. He chases the Road Runner. He almost gets the Road Runner, but because he runs into a dilemma, what's the first thing he does? He takes the contraption that he spent all this time building, all this money on. He throws it away, and he goes back to the ACME and starts all over again. I think the problem is that sometimes we don't give things time enough to work. And because we don't give things time enough to work, that's the reason why, gentlemen, has been to 100 of these. Because the moment things start off well, from the idea to everything, and then the moment we hit some kind of issue or whatnot, we go back to the ACME shop, throw everything away, and we start all over again. I can only speak for me. I am not one that just preaches this from the pulpit. My team can tell you. I'm right there with Quincy. I know gang members just like he know them. Posse members, group members, whatever. I'm right there. As a matter of fact, one of the incidents that we had uh, just a couple of weeks ago, one of the young men who's in our program got into a little trouble. Police had to go to his house to pick him up. He would not come out of his house. 
So they sent someone over, Mr. Bennett, who's sitting there, flipped the script. They called him, said, we want you to talk to this guy. Eventually, they get the guy out of the house. One of the first phone calls after Mr. Bennett, he says, call Bishop Harris. <laughs> I'm not doing anything unless Bishop Harris is there because I am one that believes in, in going into the problem, not being a part of it. So just to end my answer, I don't know what everyone else's intention is, but I think there has to be a commitment to actually do the ideas that we walk away from these meetings with and to stay sustainable in these ideas and not keep changing them from moment to moment just because we hit a hardship. And I'll be quiet uh, after that point, give someone else an opportunity. Hi, my question is for the uh, Deputy Chief. Um, somewhat familiar with the community safety partnership work and find it really, really impressive. Just along the lines of Bishop's point about doing the ideas. A couple of questions, if, if you could respond. One is, at, sort of at the line level, how do sergeants or the commanders of the community safety partnership manage and evaluate relationship building with officers? So how do they know when people are doing it good, when people are not doing it well? Uh, how do they manage that development? The second question is, how do officers in other units, like proactive gang units or gang investigations, view those officers? And then to the extent that you think there is a difference in culture between relationship-based policing and the community safety partnership and the culture of gang units, for example, how do you scale the culture of relationship-based policing in an agency that's so enormous? To the first question, that's, that's a really, really difficult one because it's very hard to measure relationship. It's very hard to measure the demeanor of a community when a cop walked in six months ago compared to when they walk in today. And, and the, the, the best example I can give you would be a, a school where we went on to a school uh, to go and read to kids and when the first day we walked onto that school, the kids ran away screaming, they're here to arrest us. And three months later, when we walked onto that same campus, they were jumping on the police car. But how do you measure that? It's very, very difficult. Um, it, was, uh, it, it was a challenge uh, to, to get through with super, and you talk about line supervisors and line officers because one of the things that, that we did when we built the unit up so that we would address the second, part of the second part of your question, was I, I, I kind of ran with the theory, you can't build a baseball team with nine catchers. And so I couldn't have cops with the same thought and mentality. I had to bring in some gang officers. I had to bring in some patrol officers. I had to bring in some community-minded minded officers. And then it was my job to get them to understand that we are going to be working, doing relationship-based policing, cultural-based policing, and that your job is changing. And that takes time. And any time you're changing culture, you have to really be able to appreciate, bring out, point out victories. And, and people need to understand that, that if, you, if you don't do that, then people will, will get tired, they'll get burnt out, and they'll think we're not accomplishing anything. Unfortunately, when you do it too many times, people think that you're just congratulating yourself and saying, oh, we're done. No, we're not done. But I need you to understand that we have gone from here to here. The kids are not running away anymore. And that's really important. So let's build on that. And it, it, the, the officers from the gang units, it was a lot harder to crack them. I had one guy who I literally brought into my office on the third time. I drew the line and said, if you cross it one more time, you're gone. A short time later, he was the first officer at a scene where a five-year-old was run over and killed and tried to give the kid mouth to mouth, to, in, in, uh, or I should say CPR, in order to, to save him. And he ended, up, he ended up being invited by the family to be a pallbearer at the funeral. The family, this, this five-year-old who lived in Jordan Downs, wanted to be a cop because of some of the relationships he had built with some of the officers. And so they asked this officer to be part of the funeral as a pallbearer and then if, asked if they could sound the siren while they dropped the casket into the ground. You talk about mind changing. He is now 
the oversight officer, he's a sergeant now, he oversees the Community Safety Partnership because with leadership, you push it, but you allow them to have the experiences to see, oh my God, it works. And it does change the mindset of officers. You know, it's really easy to, to, to supervise a group of, of, of 10 gang officers. Everybody thinks the same. It's a supervisory nightmare to supervise 10 people who think differently. And they're always pointing at each other. And it goes back to, to, I think, to your point. In order to work together, everybody needs to understand that this problem that we have belongs to everybody. It is not any one entity's problem. It is everybody's problem. And we can't sit and argue about who did what, who gets the credit. We need to throw out the egos. We need to get to work as, as, as people, as partners, and work together to solve the problems. I have one more, one more thing to throw in because I really haven't heard it here. Politicians need to get on board. They hold the purse strings, they make policy, and they have a lot of power, and, and they're rarely talked about. Chief brought up a couple of things that I want to put a finer point on that were implicated in the gentleman's question on how do we pass the baton. And you talked about the importance of leadership in shifting the culture of some of the, uh, some of the members of the department that you were supervising. The community has to offer some insulation to protect that leadership. Otherwise, we have to cultivate new leadership again and again and again. So when Chief step, steps out and makes a tough call and he's putting himself in a vulnerable position, the community has to offer some insulation to protect Chief. Same thing with, with DA Fox, same thing with our other leaders. Otherwise, they're vulnerable, right, to getting replaced, and then we have to start this process all over again, and we essentially drop the baton. I think we are over here on this side now for, for a question. Well, hello, everybody. This has been just the most amazing experience for me. I'm Dr. Salim Hilton. I'm out of the Washington, D.C. area. I represent a company called Youth and Families in Crisis, LLC. And we've been hired to come into Fort Myers, Florida, to create a, an initiative for the new chief of police down there, Chief Derek Diggs. He could not make it this time. He, we, we were supposed to meet, but he asked me to bring all the information back. This is just too much to take back. <laughs> but at any rate, I just wanted to share a couple of things because I've heard so much. I mean, it's just been overwhelming the amount of information that I have taken from these various panels. One of the things is um, we have created what we call the Fort Myers Clergy Police Community Partnership. And with that effort, we have brought the community together. One of the first things that they told us when we got to Fort Myers, you're talking about bringing a community together and you want to start with the clergy, good luck. Me being a metaphysician and a, and a total optimist, I said, okay, you watch me. We have this community coming together from the mayor's office, the city council. We just presented to the city council last Monday. They literally gave us a standing ovation. They could not imagine how we accomplished so much in just a short amount of time with such a small budget to begin to bring the community together on all levels. I do want to talk to the bishop, and I want to talk to Mr. Reverend McBride, to see how I can get some input from them. I do understand that uh, uh, Dr. Kennedy is coming in August. I do believe that he and the chief are talking about Fort Myers becoming a ceasefire city. I do hope so. Because when we first got there, I'm gonna be real quick. When we first got there, we spent four days with the entire police force. We discovered that Fort Myers is the most racist city in the state of Florida. My question before I sit down, because I haven't heard a lot about that, how do, as we continue to progress, 
How do we overcome such uh, overt, blatant, and racist environments such as what we are engaging with the police force down there? Now, I know we're talking about hiring or trying to find and hire new uh, officers of color, but how do we overcome this high level of racism in this fine south West Southern Florida city that I'm beginning to love. Because <laughs> I'm from a cold place like DC, right? But anyway, can you give us some insight on that? Any of you, any of you race, racism experts? Thank you. I don't know if I'm a racism expert. <laughs> I'm let you <laughs> but I do know that, again, that's a place that is permeated best when you talk about the amalgamation of faith. Um, one of the things that our coalition has been able to do, and I'm really grateful for persons like uh, Director Stein, who's here with me today, Director Jones, who's here with me today, who do our administration for our ceasefire. One of the things that they did not limit me in was they said, number one, you don't have to get all the fanciful preachers. That means you don't have to limit yourself to just working with preachers who have big congregations or things like that. And so breaking off that limit gave me the opportunity to reach into who it was more of anyway. It's more smaller churches and congregations than there are larger ones, right? And so beginning to tap into them, I found that they were more eager to do the work and they had more of a grounds, hands-on approach because they were closer to the work because of the smaller of their congregation, they had a certain intimacy. So that's one of the things that you may want to do as you are pulling together, you know, congregations, churches. Don't, uh, the Bible says, again, my faith tradition, don't despise the day of small beginnings, right? And my grandmother just said that every big cake started with small crumbs, right? Um, how are we going to address um, some of the racial inequality, especially as, as it permeates through the police department? Now, I can't answer that from the police department in, but what I can say is, it seems to be as I work with officers, seems to be again that the faith is right in the center of that. One of the things that the coalition has done is because of the 67 riots in Detroit, which were really horrible. As a matter of fact, there's a movie coming out about it uh, in August sometime about that whole thing there. And what you'll begin to see is that at the center of that, was still this idea of faith and, and church, right? Um, and so one of the things that the coalition has been able to do, we don't just have African-American churches involved. Um, we have uh, uh, Caucasian churches are involved. We have suburban churches are involved, right? Because at the end of the day, again, we don't have time to wait on the persons who are just there for the limelight, who are just there for the camera roll. We need people who are already engaged in the work, who need to be a part of that healing. And I would love to talk to you more um, later about other things that, that we're doing. And I think that it just starts with the, with the idea. And if you can find one person, right? If you can find one person who's willing to do that, then you get some momentum. I'll end with this statement, something that um, Deputy Chief talked about Honor goes a long way. You cannot bring people together simply on the purpose of telling them what they're doing wrong. You have to honor what people have attempted to do, if nothing else. They may not have been successful at it, but if they attempted to do good, if they started out with the idea of doing good, start with honoring that. And you'll find out, again, my grandmother said, you can draw more flies with honey than you can with vinegar. So start with pulling together the how do you honor people and then as the work is seen as honorable, as you celebrate those victories, then more and more people hopefully will begin to come together. We are at the end of our time. If we did not get to your question, charge it to your moderator, but extend a little empathy when you do that, right? Uh, if we can take a moment to, to just give uh, a round of applause to this awesome panel.
Thanks, everyone. The panel uh, breakout panels will start promptly at 11.15. And please take your belongings with you, because we won't be back in this theater again today. One more round of applause for our panelists. <laughs>